The easiest way to understand carnism is through a brief example. If you imagine you're the guest at a dinner party and your host serves you a delicious beef stew and you ask her for the recipe and she replies that the secret is in the meat. You need to start out with three pounds of extra lean golden retriever. Your reaction is an example of what I call carnism. Carnism is the invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals. It's essentially the opposite of veganism. We tend to assume it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table, but when eating animals is not a necessity for a survival, which is the case in much of the world today, then it is a choice, and choices always stem from beliefs. I think we need to be aware not simply of the reality of animal agriculture, but of the belief system that is carnism, that has shaped our preferences, our thoughts, our feelings, and guided our food choices like an invisible hand since we've been you know, old enough to decide what to put in our mouths. Um, we're eating animals, but just at the moment we're weaned, really. And you know, we, people really need to step outside of the system in order to make choices that authentically, that, that reflect what they authentically think and feel rather than what they've been taught to think and feel. So awareness is the first step. Um, and then, you know, ideally people can make choices that are doing less harm to the, themselves and to the planet and to other animals. And when people come to my talk, they know that I'm going to talk about why we love dogs, eat pigs and wear cows. So they're expecting that. And, um, and I find people to be tremendously open. And it's really just a, a further um, support for what I know to be true, which is that people care. People, in general, really do care about animals, and they care about justice, and they care about the truth. And carnism depends on our not caring, and the system is built on deception. So generally, people are very grateful for learning information that allows them to make their choices freely. Um, and that's really my goal, is to raise awareness, because without awareness, there is no free choice. What we call natural is really just the dominant culture's interpretation of history and we look at history through the lens of carnism and we look at history in a way then that justifies our current carnistic practices because our earliest ancestors were fruit eaters. Their descendants were flesh eaters. We only look as far back to in history as we need to to justify current carnistic practices when we look through the lens of carnism. And to be fair, murder and rape are arguably as long-standing and therefore as natural as eating animals, and yet we don't invoke the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. So, you know, there have been vegans um, for many years. The earliest known ethical vegetarians, I believe, are from about 3,500 years ago. Um, throughout human history, there have been people who have chosen to not eat animals for ethical reasons. The time is really right, and, you know, especially here in Germany. I find that Germany is... Um, it's a country that's really at the cutting edge of um, veganism. It's a leader in many ways in the vegan movement and can really be a model for the rest of the world. Um, and I just, I see us moving toward sort of um, a tipping point where people, more and more people are becoming aware of the problem and concerned and they want to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So I'm very hopeful about the future. I know my talk was not comfortable for people to hear. I think it's a deviation from much of the theme that's been talked about here. Um, but many people anyway have thanked me for raising their awareness about the issue.